Okay, this time we're going to revisit conditions precedent. Now, we've talked about them a number of times. Uh, and so I've got a couple of slides here just to remind you you've seen them before. Uh, it's basically remembering that a condition precedent is essentially a kind of checkpoint uh, that needs to be satisfied or waived before the completion of a business sale and purchase agreement or a share sale and purchase agreement uh, and basically we've talked about we've talked about them a number of times they've been negotiated assume they're there and we're now in that period between the agreement being signed and it closing so clearly one of the things that we need to do is make sure that the conditions precedent have been fulfilled or if they can be waived, if the parties agree to proceed without them, um, often they'll be waived or modified to be made into conditions uh, subsequent. Uh, again, slide just on the screen here, I think, maybe there. Can't remember which way I need to point. Um, and again, reminding you of the differences between conditions precedent and conditions subsequent. For now, let's think about conditions uh, subsequent as the things that need to happen after the deal has closed and the buyer has taken control. Uh, now, we could bundle in a material adverse change uh, provision here. It's kind of a negative CP in a sense because essentially if there is a material adverse change clause, it's essentially giving the buyer an out or maybe the seller as well, but usually the buyer an out if there is some material change, something unexpected or even potentially contemplated, uh, but that materially adversely affects the party's position if they are to go forward. Um, and But overall, conditions precedent could be about anything. The slide that I have up now is giving a few examples. Uh, earlier on in the semester, we talked about ACCC and merger clearances. I'm going to use FIRB and the Treasurer's approval as my kind of example uh, going forward because we haven't really done a deep dive into that yet. But the other things could be that the purchaser's finance has been approved. Um, the uh, obtaining key supplier approval, so the landlord agreeing to novate the lease and allow the continued use of the premises, or a key supplier agreeing that they will continue to supply, notwithstanding some kind of change of control clause in their own documentation. Um, all of these kind of conditions precedent, have a look at the slide at your leisure, all of these conditions precedent tend to be negotiated out of the due diligence during the um, negotiation phase. Uh, every deal is unique, as I keep on saying, but every deal will throw up things that the parties might not be able to have completely sorted out at the point in time when the agreement is signed, but that need to be completed in order for uh, closure to occur and for the arrangements to, to result in the buyer owning the business and the seller selling it. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to use FIRB, so the Foreign Investment Review Board. It's my key example here. The principles are pretty similar across the board for how conditions precedent works. One of the reasons I wanted to choose this one, other than the fact we haven't really done a deep dive into it in the lecture materials yet, is that this is a condition precedent that can't be waived. Um, if FIRB approval is required or if the Treasurer's approval, approval is required or a notification or a waiver is required, um, we can't proceed without it and I'll explain why in just a moment. But Suffice it to start with that the relevant law here is the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Act 1975. You'll see that in much of the documentation online and in any commentary. It's referred to as the FATA or FATA. Um, so basically that law requires that uh, there are a range of transactions, I'll talk about which ones in a minute, need to be notified to the financial, sorry, the Foreign Investment Review Board for approval. It does not require that significant actions or reviewable national security actions be notified to FERB at present, although that is subject to review at the moment. 
Um, but the FIRB policy recommends that before engaging in any kind of significant action or reviewable national security action, um, an application should be made to the Foreign Investment Review Board FERB, to ensure that the action doesn't contravene the national interest uh, in the case of a significant action or national security in the case of a reviewable national security action. Lots of words there. It's going to be important that you look at the legislation and at commentary to make sure you understand. Uh, what's important here is that applications for this approval, the notifications uh, when we've got a significant action or a national security transaction, they need to be lodged before the proposed transaction becomes effective. So if FIRB approval can't be obtained before entering into the acquisition documents themselves, it's going to be absolutely imperative that the completion of the transaction, so the documents are conditional on the Federal Treasurer issuing a no objection notification, which is unconditional or subject only to those conditions that the relevant party considers in its discretion to be acceptable, or that the relevant period following the giving of the notice relating to the transaction under Section 82 has expired without uh, the, any prohibition order being made under the Foreign Ex Acquisitions and Takeovers Act. Um, otherwise, you're going to be in a world of pain. This, um, the Foreign Investment Review Board process is a true condition precedent, uh, and so the actual effect of the contract needs to be conditional on that process being completed. So when does it apply? Under Section 4 of FATA and Regulation 18 of the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers of Regulations, so FATR, um, it applies when a foreign person is uh, proposes to uh, uh, to enter into a notifiable action or notifiable national security action. Okay, so let's just start with who's a foreign person. An individual not ordinarily resident in Australia, a corporation in which an individual not ordinarily resident in Australia, a foreign corporation or a foreign government holds a substantial interest. So in other words, an interest of 20% or more. Uh, thirdly, it could be a corporation in which two or more people uh, persons and legal persons, each of whom is an, oh sorry, not necessarily all legal persons, uh, so two or more individuals who are not ordinarily resident in Australia, a foreign corporation or a foreign government hold an aggregate substantial interest, so 40% or more. Uh, it applies where we have a trustee of a trust, in which the individual not ordinarily resident in Australia, a foreign corporation or a foreign government holds a substantial interest, so 20% or more. Uh, the trustee of a trust in which two or more persons, each of whom is an individual not ordinarily resident in Australia, a foreign corporation or a foreign government hold an aggregate substantial interest, so together 40% or more. A foreign government or a foreign government investor, a uh, general partner of limited partnership in which an individual not ordinarily resident in Australia or a foreign corporation or a foreign government holds a substantial interest, 20% is our benchmark still, and a general partner of a limited partnership in which you get it, two or more people, each of whom is an individual not ordinarily resident in Australia, a foreign corporation or a foreign government, together hold 40% or more, an aggregate substantial interest. So the other terms there are notifiable action or notifiable national security action. So essentially it's notifiable if there would be a change of control that results in a foreign person achieving, so as we've just described that foreign person, achieving those threshold interests or greater if the transaction is successful. Um, so at the end of the day, really what we're always looking at is uh, do we have foreign uh, entities involved? If they do, are they going to achieve those notifiable interests? And then we also need to look at the size of the transaction. Um, so basically that substantial interest test, the 20%, um, and then we've got the size of the business or the transaction. 
So essentially for most entities or business investments, if the size of the business following the transaction happening is $310 million uh, or more, um, it's a bigger amount, so it's $1.3 billion for private investors at, who come from certain free trade agreement companies. And I've got a couple of uh, slides down the track. I've got a list of the free trade agreement countries for you. $310 million for private investors from free trade agreement countries who are investing in sensitive businesses. And again, we'll have a look at what a sensitive business is in just a minute. Um, and ultimately, everything um, where we've got a foreign government investor. So it might exclude certain governments and certain business activities, but at the end of the day, the safe bet is if it's a foreign government investor, you're going to need to take it to the FIRB. Um, now, the type of business is also relevant as well, and the thresholds drop with sensitive businesses. So, for example, with agribusiness, uh, uh, $67 million is our threshold. Um, media businesses. Now, media is sensitive because clearly we don't want too much concentration in that industry, but also we want to be in a position where Australia's media is um, independent. Just sigh. Um, but, it, yes, so that's the public policy approach, and so, again, it's a sensitive business. Also, what we call national security businesses. And, again, take a look at Guidance Note 8 to think about whether or not the business that we're looking at in any particular situation might be a national security business or not. Um, it's also relevant if a foreign company is starting a business in Australia, um, it still needs to notify FIRB if um, it's going to start an Australian business, including starting a national security business, or is already carrying on an Australian business, but the business starts a new and different activity. So, okay, that's a lot of words, and now there's even more words on the slide. I want you to have a look at this or go into Lexis Plus and have a look. What's on the slide here is a, an example of a condition precedent for FIRB approval. Uh, now, basically, you can see the language here is talking about, it, it's, I've, I've taken it straight from the text um, from Lexis Plus, but essentially it is saying that the obligations of the parties under, and it might be the whole of the agreement, or it might just be to pay the purchase price and to uh, take over, hand over the keys, none of those obligations will be effective until we've got the satisfaction or waiver of each of the following. So FIRB approval number one, or the treasurer notifying and no issuing a no objection notification, um, or the expiration of the relevant period. So basically section 82 sets out the period of time, it changes from time to time, it sets out the period of time in which the treasurer has to come back to the and respond in the, to the notice. And if if FIRB, well the treasurer, but FIRB are the ones who administer it, if they don't come back within the prescribed period of Time, then they no longer have the opportunity uh, to either apply conditions or to prevent the transaction going ahead. And the public policy reason for this is clear. Um, uh, and one of the things that um, I will point you to is Treasury's relatively recent 2023 um uh, guidance in relation to FIRB and the policy statements where Jim Tarchamas is essentially saying we don't want to slow down business. Uh, this should not be a negative position. We want to approve as many things as we can and if you're advising us about a transaction then it's up to us to put the resources in it to make sure it goes ahead. Um, so take a look at how the clause works. You can see that it provides for um, how the satisfaction of the conditions will be dealt with. And this is quite common. Each party will notify the other party if they become aware that a condition has either been satisfied 
or it's not going to be satisfied, or they're ready to waive it. Now, FIRB would be very, very rare to waive it. Uh, it might be waived if it were the condition was unconditional approval. Treasurer came within the condition, the condition that the buyer and the seller were prepared to live with. Um, and again, the clause also sets out waiver and the termination um, and what the effect of termination will be. So it's quite common that some provisions, for example, uh, provisions relating to the confidentiality of information passed over during due diligence would continue to be binding, notwithstanding that the deal itself doesn't go ahead. Um, so I said May 2023 a minute ago. It's May 2024. I'm losing track of myself. So some significant reforms were announced around that time. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about that is this reaffirming that it is not a negative test. Uh, well, it, sorry, they're calling it a negative test. There is a presumption that investment proposals should proceed unless they're found to be contrary to the national interest or to national security. Um, and ultimately, this framework gives the Treasurer uh, at the time the power to decide whether to not object to a proposed investment, to impose conditions on an investment, to prohibit a proposed investment, or to require the disposal, so sale, removal, or transfer of an interest that has been acquired outside of these rules, or otherwise to unwind a transaction. For most investment proposals, uh, so, you know, like this language, we see significant actions or notifiable actions, but just let's think of them as investment proposals or conditional agreements for the sale and purchase of a, an Australian asset. Treasury and FERB are going to look at whether the investment uh, is in Australia's national interest or not. In fact, the test is if it is contrary to Australia's national interest. It doesn't actually have to be in Australia's national interest. It just needs to be not contrary to Australia's national interest. Um, and they look at things like national security, competition generally, the impact on other Australian government policies like tax revenues, the environment, climate change, etc. cetera, uh, the impact on the economy overall and the community and the character of the investor or the foreign investor really. So for other investment proposals uh, where there is national security action or a reviewable national security action of some sort, Treasury will only look at whether the investment proposal is contrary to Australia's national security. When assessing investments under the national security test, Treasury and FIRB consider the extent to which the investment will affect Australia's ability to protect its strategic and security interests. So national interest is not just about... Uh, defence. It's also about climate, about the environment, about media and a range of national interests. Um, so the next couple of slides in the pack are really just here to help you find some key information, listing out the free trade agreements, giving you a high level in overview of how you'll understand what a sensitive business is, looking at guidance note seven, and guidance note eight is the one that deals with national security. Um, and then the last slide, oh, I don't see if you put any pictures on it. I'll do that after I finish here. Um, I, ultimately, when we've got to the completion phase, one of the key tasks that lawyers will have is ensuring that all of the conditions precedent have either been signed off that the notices have been given in accordance with the relevant provisions in the agreement, or they have been waived. Uh, and in some cases, a party might agree to waive the requirement uh, that it uh, to a conditions pre condition precedent being satisfied. Um, often it will do that if it's immaterial uh, to them at the end of the day, that they, they're satisfied that it's all going to be okay. But if it's a bigger issue, they may actually just shift it and say, okay, let's make that a condition subsequent. Um, we're pretty sure it's all going to happen. It must happen after the deal goes on. But if it doesn't happen for some reason by some later date or if we aren't able to achieve it by a particular date, then there's going to be a subsequent 
purchase plus adjustment of some sort. Um, okay, so that's all I had for this uh, little video recording. I just want to know, even though I've concentrated here on FERB, I want to remind you that the principles about the passing um, or the film of a condition for a certain or decisions for them to waive it are uh, important. And one of the reasons that I highlighted FERB is that because the law effectively says that the treasurer can undo these transactions uh, and even declare that they are not effective. Uh, and so any agreement needs to uh, where there is a notifiable interest or where FIRB approvals are required will need to be notified and the time period will need to be followed through. Questions, concerns, frustrations, compliments? Worthy drill.